Suddenly everything kind of started happening. I'm like, holy shit. Please welcome my good friend, Quasi Thomas. I have been performing stand-up um, since 2001. So uh, what's the math on that? 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> That's easy math. Jake Spencer. I think it's four and a half years, a little more than four and a half years. Alicia Dillon. Just over two years now. And Kanye. For about seven and a half years now. Kevin Von Helden. For a little over five years. <laughs> Fuck him, Taylor, man. For six years. Amanda Smith. My first set was 12 years ago. Robert Pang. For like five years. Give it up for Amber Harper Young. I've been doing stand up 11 years. This always sounds corny when I say it out loud, but it's the truth. I've always been that person that needs to make everyone laugh. I'm the guy cracking jokes at a funeral. I'm the guy. You know, lightening the mood when the when the parents were fighting and stuff like that. You know, and uh, just I've always been able to find what little humor there is in most situations and just kind of bring it to light. And I found a way to squeeze a buck out of it. And uh, but yeah, I, I just love performing because I love connecting with people, especially you know people I don't know. If I can bring a an opinion or a joke or something like that to people and make them think about it and whatever. I just, I still love doing it. I still, that's still why I do it. Tell you a tiny bit about myself. Uh, born and raised in Montreal, born and raised in, in Montreal, Quebec. Anybody here ever been? Oh, nice, nice, nice. So you guys know, now you guys know it's a city where no means maybe. <laughs> I keep forgetting what year it is. I don't mean, um, I don't mean that in a creepy way. I don't mean that in like a, in a rapey way at all. Uh, it's just, if you've been, especially, you know, if you clapped, and you wooed, then you must know that Montreal, you know, my hometown, my stomping grounds, it's a, it's a morally, sexually, loose <laughs> environment. I remember I was probably like 15, 16 years old. I was, I was in the metro. That's like our SkyTrain only, it's underground. Um, I, and I asked this lady for the time once, and she was like, I don't wear a watch, but I haven't been late in hours. Let's go. <laughs> That's where I'm from. That's what raised me, right? And I live in Vancouver now. Vancouver's home now. Vancouver's, uh, Vancouver's where my DVDs are, so it's home. <laughs> Vancouver's the last place I went split skis on an abortion, so it's home. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just I'm, <laughs> I'm fucking kidding, guys. I paid for the whole thing. I'm a gentleman. And people always ask me obvious, the obvious question, again, especially if you have the comparison. Why on earth would I leave Montreal, this crazy wild party town, for Vancouver, which is beautiful. Don't get me wrong, Vancouver is fucking gorgeous, but Vancouver is kind of like grandma's house. <laughs> right? Like, you, like, it's beautiful, it's amazing, you can't believe how old it is because it's so intact, but it, you can't fucking touch anything. <laughs> 
Vancouver still has the Italian grandma plastic on it. Oh, it's definitely not completely amoral. I don't think anything is completely amoral. Uh, we have, we we get the attention of somewhere between five and three thousand people. You know, uh, when you have someone's attention, I think. I mean, as a comedian, the end game is to make them laugh. Let's just get that out of the way. You know, um, however you get there is your business, and you should be able to stand up for what you talk about on stage. Um, I've gone through several different what's important to me is as far as comedy goes uh, at the end of the day like I just said it's always about having people leave in a better mood than they came in at the very least give them something to think about go home and talk about um, these days I mean there's quite a lot of turmoil going on in the world right now these days as a black comedian I like to uh, present a conversation in a, in a palatable way even though like Sometimes I don't feel like I'm responsible for that. Like, people should be educating themselves. Uh, but seeing as how I have their attention, I can find ways to be humorous but still informative about the things that are going on in the world right now and, again, send them home with something to talk about. But hopefully, you know, uh, good-humored. It's a little embarrassing, but you guys know the story about someone moving across the world or moving across the country to be with somebody? Yeah. Yeah. I moved across the country to be away from somebody. <laughs> I don't know if you ever felt bi-coastal hatred, but the shit was fucking real. I, like, the first thing I did was I put my back to the Pacific Ocean to make sure I couldn't be any further away <laughs> without getting my socks wet. I was like, I fucking hate you! <laughs> yeah, it's weird, man. I'm 39 years old and I'm single, and it's like, I, I know, uh, before I go on, yes. I, half of you guys already decided I was like an eight-year-old Sicilian. <laughs> the other half of you guys are like, what the fuck part of Africa is Sicily? <laughs> just, <laughs> just go to Nigeria, make a left, you can't miss it. <laughs> but it's weird, it's weird being like a single, no kids, you know, and a 39-year-old. It's not like I got a whole bunch of friends my age in the same situation, right? Like, most of my friends are all coupled up, they're all married up, but, you know, a bunch of them are popping out their third round of kids, you know? And if I have any control of my life whatsoever, I'm not doing that shit. Like, I'm not having kids at all, right? Yeah, you can woo that up. <laughs> Fucking decisions. I know there's a mom or a dad in here looking at me like, that's a fucking option! <laughs> Honestly, I became honorary uncle to like 87,000 children in the last like two years. All named Jackson. <laughs> Even the girls. <laughs> now look at me all weird, I know someone in here owns a Jackson. Acting cute like theirs is special. Like, no, we spell ours with a Q. Like, fuck right off. <laughs> No oh, man, I have a kid. Having a kid today in this economy, you fucking nuts. Having a kid today is like having a yacht. <laughs> I don't want either, unless I'm so fucking rich, I won't recognize the financial damage it's causing me, or someone surprises me with one. <laughs> and in both cases, my reaction would be like, oh fuck, you shouldn't have. <laughs> start looking for gift receipts <laughs> i just hope that we start bigging ourselves up you know um instead of instead of looking for that validation from elsewhere you know from the states or from la or whatever you know i just hope that one day we can become our own thing that other places look up to and and uh instead of just constantly exporting our acts you know every time someone gets a little good they go somewhere else because a bit of money gets thrown at him. I, I hope one day, and I hope to be the face of that as far as acting and comedy goes. I just, I sincerely hope to maintain our acts and build our infrastructure up to where we don't need outside validation and we can we can control our own terms as far as comedy and, and just to support our acts and to support our comedians and our actors and our artists all together. As we're like, again, like, you know, my, my coupled up friends, they don't really want to spend that much time with me because I represent the option of freedom. And who the fuck needs that in a relationship, right? But uh, I'm going to tell you a story. Like, a, a really good friend of mine, my buddy Brett, a lot of the comics know him here. He's another comedian. Uh, one of the first guys I met when I moved out to BC. Uh, great guy, man. We hit it off immediately, like, day after day, night after night. It was just me and Brett. 
And in hindsight, it was a little gay, but we were having a good time. <laughs> but, but <laughs> we got close. And, um, you know, Brett meets this wonderful young woman. This is not about her at all. She's an amazing girl. And, uh, fellas, what happens, what happens when your homeboy falls in love? You lose him. That's, thank you. Thank you. Was that, was that you? Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. It's nice to have a guy actually say it. Normally, I ask that question in a crowd, and it's some woman in the darkness like, you ain't never seen him again! <laughs> like, crazy proud that she made a motherfucker disappear. <laughs> right? So my boy falls in love, and fast forward, like, four years, I don't fucking hear or see from Brett, and that's fine, you know? My man's happy, I'm happy. But he gives me a call, and he's like, yo, Quace, man, I'm so sorry, it's been forever and a day. Why don't you come over? I'm thinking, wicked, I get to hang out with Brett again. Play some Nintendo, smoke some weed. I don't know what the fuck dudes do anymore. I, I lost all my friends to love. <laughs> but they're happy, so I'm happy. But that wasn't the case. Basically, <laughs> basically, Brett and his girl, they just bought a house, and he wanted me to come over to get the tour. You guys know the tour? The all-important, all-validating tour? because it's not enough that you can afford property in British fucking Columbia. You gotta rub it in the face of the one motherfucker you know who can't. That's mean-spirited, right? And I mean, and, and the thing is, home ownership has to be something that would impress me for the tour to matter, but you can't be sarcastic or indifferent on the tour, right? You gotta be crazy impressed on the tour. Right? So I got, I got my man taking me around the house, and, and you got one grown man looking at another grown man, like, well? <laughs> That's the bathroom, like, whoa! And, you know, and again, I can't be like, you know, I gotta be on, I'm on the other side of this exchange, like, oh, shit. Yeah, 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 cool, yeah, dope, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I see you got it fully loaded with the sink, and... Was that a toilet bowl? Okay, my man, my man. Maybe I should move in with my next girlfriend so I can stop taking shits in the kitchen. I know what a fucking bathroom is. My other love, my other, my other passion, my other great love is uh, is being an actor. I'm an actor in the city as well. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been cool. It's been cool. I've had a I've had a decent run. Um, without like, I mean, I, like I'm not trying to complain because a gig is a gig is a gig. But you know, there's a, there's a there's a weird going on. You know, like as I, as I mentioned, you know, previously, there's about there's about there's seven. <laughs> Well, seven black people in Vancouver, <laughs> right? And five of us are actors. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna get back to that in a second. But I've had a good, I've had a good run though. Um, working backwards, I uh, like right now I'm in a pretty cool show called Snowpiercer. Uh, I, I work on that pretty often, and that's like, yeah, yeah. My landlord is more excited than all of you. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, uh, but working backwards, you know, I've had some smaller gigs, but it kind of builds up to the big one, right? Like, I, I got a part in uh, the Tony Braxton biopic. They filmed that. Lord knows where they found the necessary Negroes to film that, but they did. It was, it was in New West. Who am I kidding? They did it in New West. That shit is Malawi light. <laughs> well, I got a part in that playing the, the radio DJ. I got to interview her. I thought that was pretty cool. A few months before that, I got a part in the uh, Disney remake of uh, Adventures in Babysitting. Yeah, I'm seeing some specks of gray in the crowd, so I know you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, I got a part in the remake of that playing the hip-hop DJ. A few months before that, I got a part in a Lifetime movie called I Do, I Do, I Do. What did I play? I played the wedding DJ. <laughs> now look, a gig is a gig is a gig. I'm not complaining, but you, you smelling what I'm selling here? That, 
You're picking up what I'm putting down, they're trying to pigeonhole the brother, right? Because as I said, it's just me and these four other brothers. And so every time I walk into an audition room, it's just me and these guys trying to out-black each other. <laughs> right? Because they don't have us in there fighting it out for, for, for Don Cheadle roles or like Morgan Freeman parts. They got us in there for like, you know, drug dealer number two, gangster number one. I had an audition. I shit you not, I had an audition for Crackhead on the Ground. <laughs> Someone wrote that. I still don't know if that was the name of the movie, if that was the line I was supposed to say, if that was the name of the character. I just walked into the room, they're like, crack it on the ground. I was like, me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, we're going back, uh, is that, <laughs> it's like, you know, we're going back a few Star Warses on this one. <laughs> That's how you know we're in trouble. I'm measuring time in Star Wars. Is. Not, uh, not the last, not any of the TV ones, not the, uh, not the last. You guys are going to have to forgive me, actually. I don't know what they're all called. I have sex with girls. Um, <laughs> but I guess the first of the new wave of Star Wars is there was a, a hoopla. There was an uproar. Uh, because one of the producers decided to cast a black actor as a stormtrooper, and the internet fucking broke. Do you guys remember this at all? Yeah. I know it was a few years back, but people lost their fucking shit. And it's just like, that, and that's the big thing right now, you know, like, oh, we need diversity in casting, da, da, da. but then people lose their mind over, like, storytelling. And, you know, another really good example is, you know, who's going to be the next Bond, right? Who's going to be, and everybody and their grandmother wants Idris Elba to be the next Bond. <laughs> Yeah, 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 Idris Elba, I fucking certainly hope not. What the fuck about Idris Elba screams secret agent? If, if Idris Elba walked into an underground Russian casino, this guy, first of all, he's either getting murdered immediately or he's leaving with 20 phone numbers. Right? There's nothing that screams clandestine about Idris Elba. So we're not thinking about these things. We're just like oh, throwing black faces at the body. Right? But there was a huge fucking thing and people lost their shit that this black guy was going to play a stormtrooper. And I'm thinking the only way it matters, all right, especially nowadays, the only way it fucking matters that a black guy is playing a stormtrooper is if you can pick him out of a crowd of stormtroopers. <laughs> Right, because we've all seen at least half of one of these movies, right? And I'm, I'm not speaking Japanese here. We all know what the stormtroopers are. Like all white robot looking guys, a little bit of black trim. They kind of look like the 09 Jordans. The only way it matters that a black guy is playing a stormtrooper is if you could pick him out of a crowd of stormtroopers, right? Because these guys march about 150,000 deep in perfect fucking unison, right? So if in a multitude of marching stormtroopers, this motherfucker is the only one easing on down the road. <laughs> yeah, it go with the white guy. He won't do that. He won't. <laughs> one of his robot legs is rolled up because it's a little warmer than it was supposed to be that day. <laughs> Imagine they got to change the soundtrack for this guy every time he's on screen. It's like da 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 da. This is how we do it. At this stage of my career, quote unquote, for me, it's just about having a good show. I know there's a lot of things going on around this one and we got the film going on and all of that. But for me, it's a show and I just want to I want to do a really, really good set. I hope everyone else brings their A game. Yeah. What I hope is that we crush tonight's show and we were able to do it again another time. This is a weird stand-up to reference, but Dame Edna would talk about her favorite thing about stand-up was getting up on stage, walking out into an amphitheater of 3,000 people and saying, alone at last. Actually, I made some changes in my life. I stopped watching porn recently, had to cut that out uh, for a few reasons. Uh, okay, so the incest porn genre is, is you know, it's fairly, <laughs> it's so prevalent. And initially I was offended and now I'm worried that I'm not offended. You know, like, <laughs> I'm kind of dead to it. I'm like, I'm jealous at this point. I'm just like watching like, wow, 
My stepdad didn't even attend my graduation. <laughs> but... <laughs> the other issue I do have with porn, the re main reason I had to stop watching porn uh, was uh, the penises. Um, well, because when I'm watching porn, I tend to picture my penis among the porn penises. That's a losing battle right there. Like, my penis surrounded by porn penises just looks like the coach of an NBA team. Like, it's... <laughs> the only thing my penis should do in a porno is interview the other penises when they're done. Uh... I don't mean to belittle my penis. I, you know, it's, it works. It's, you know, it's the right penis for me. It's, it's, I mean, okay, it's not bent, but it's like, it kind of veers left, like, like it suggests left. It's, my penis looks like it's worried someone's following it, but it's trying to be discreet. It's like, Uh, one of the main reasons I did uh, slow down on the porn is um, I have started dating again recently. I took a long break from dating, uh, got back into it. Uh, started out with a date uh, some friends of mine at work set me up on, and it was going great uh, until ages were established, which, yeah, we should have done that out of the gate. Because I'm over 40, but she thought I was like 30, and on the flip side, it turned out she was 24, and I knew that. Um, <laughs> Okay, like that's on her. Like, who thinks this is 30? You know, like, I look like I've lost everything twice. But, <laughs> so I've been doing the Tinder thing now, so she's over the Tinder thing. Uh, Tinder kinda, kinda, kinda loans itself to bed hopping, and um, this is the first time in my life I've ever been a slut, which, yeah. You know, it's, it's educational. Um, <laughs> if nothing else, I have learned a plethora of alternate routes home. Um, I will say though, I'm not like trying to brag about my sexual prowess or anything. I'm uh, sexually, I would say that I'm 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 present. I'm <laughs> I'm attentive. Sum it up like this: I make love like I play Street Fighter. If I. If I pull off a special move, it is completely by accident. I... <laughs> up, up, down, right. What the fuck? <laughs> In what order did I press those three things? I tried to be a screenwriter for ages. It did not work. I did write a lot of plays, a lot of one-man shows. Uh, which I ended up um, performing on my own at like fringe festivals and such. And that was just like, you know, it was theater for other st theater students, basically. They were really pretentious because um, I, I thought I was smart. Um, I also thought they were comedies, but they really weren't. It would be like these like uh, dissections of like, Oh God, I can't. I haven't talked about these for ages. Sorry. Um, I had this whole one-man show just about guys that got in, got into fights, and I was like this alpha male in the show, talking about all the fights I got in. And I didn't realize that that in itself was comedy. Watching me talk about being a badass, um, and also I would write plays with friends. We do like eh, little interesting like variety type shows of everybody writes a bit of a story about growing up in a mall or something like that. I don't know. That was a long answer. You've all heard there's been a bunch of coyote attacks in Vancouver. Uh, and this is on the news recently. Coyote attacked two women having a picnic in the park at 1.30 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> you can't present it to me like that. Like, you just made the crime the least interesting part of the story. A coyote attacked two women having a picnic in the park at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> right before it attacked, instead of growling, the coyote just went, the fuck? <laughs> like, 
There are some theories as to what happened. Uh, one of the most prevalent ones is the women were more than likely having sex in the park. And then one of two things happened. Uh, one, the police decided to pretend to agree with their cover story just to protect their dignity. And you know what? If they did, more power to them. Uh, but there's also option two. What if the police believed them? <laughs> what if the police were like, Mr. Davis, we have some bad news. Your wife was attacked by a coyote. She's minor injuries, but she will need to spend the night in the hospital. Where was she? Oh, just a fairly mundane 1.30 a.m. foodless picnic in the woods with that new girl from work that she never stops talking about. One of the things I learned pretty quickly at open mics is the whole idea that stand-up comedy is the last bastion of free speech is kind of bullshit. Um, there's always rules to what you have to say. Uh, there's always consequences to what you say. That's what I said. There's always going to be consequences to your words. Uh, and I think some people are putting too much importance in stand-up on breaking rules as opposed to what it's supposed to be, which is just making people laugh. I just want to be a respected comedian. I want to make it to the point where I'm actually where I'm actually a comedian, if that makes sense. I still feel weird saying... I, usually I just tell people I do comedy. I don't like saying... I don't feel like I'm a stand-up yet, so yeah, the goal at this point in time, the main thing I want to do is just become a comedian. I actually visited my mom recently back on the island. I hadn't seen her for a bit. Obviously, we all had a bit of a break from seeing our relatives, seeing my mom. Uh, and it was great, but she'd just gotten some news that actually threw her off a bit, and she shared it with me, because uh, she discovered that she was born in the 40s in England, early 40s in England, and her childbirth was very difficult. Um, and they gave her mother, my grandmother, drugs... Uh, to deal with the pain of childbirth. And uh, the drug they gave her, which was all the rage in hospitals in the 40s in England, was heroin. <laughs> they gave my grandmother heroin to deal with the pain of childbirth. My mom's like, do you think that might have affected me? <laughs> that they gave my mother heroin while she was giving birth to me? And I'm like, Mom, Mom, no, it couldn't affect you. It was the day of your birth. You were officially separate from her. Nothing was going to pass through her to you. However, it may explain why a woman that was only planning on having two children had seven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, your water's broken. Sweet, hit up the spoon! Um... I love, I love my folks, so I love my folks so much, because I, I, get, I get worried, I'm getting older, we all get older, but they're in their 70s, and they are just, like, rocking it. They have, like, nothing left to prove, everything is discounted, plus, they pretty much just do or say whatever they want. They write it off as a medical thing. Like, my stepdad, he is 76 years old. For an entire year, we thought he was going deaf. We took him to a doctor. Turns out he's just done with responding. <laughs> Without comedy, I'm just a regular Joe. I have a job in real estate marketing. I am, I'm a, you know, waitress slash actress, that sort of thing. So comedy has been a very good like amplifier for me and my voice. All right, uh, a little bit about myself. My name's Alicia. I um, I majored in English in college, so naturally I'm a waitress. Um, <laughs> Sorry, not a waitress. I was corrected recently. Waiter and waitress are gendered terms. We're not using those anymore, right? Server. Honestly, I think that's great. It's Being inclusive is so important. I just think it's kind of weird that people have a problem with the word waitress, but no one seems to have any issue calling me a curry muncher. Um, <laughs> which is a crazy thing to say, because I don't munch on curry, you guys. I slurp that shit like a fucking savage, okay? <laughs> Yum. Anyway, um, <laughs> racism, hey? It seems like it might be here to stay. My whole career in comedy has been during a pandemic. So we've only, we have no clubs. So we just do like restaurants with like bright lights and people just like enjoying their day and you're just also there. So I feel like doing comedy at the Biltmore in a place that's like meant for art is going to be a really cool experience. So I'm excited just for that specifically to like be in a place that's like built 
for sound and for actually being um i don't know the star of the night like i'm used to having to compete with like uh pac-man behind me and that sort of thing so getting to just be uh showcased nicely is, is really cool i'm excited about that it doesn't phase me too much anymore i'm pretty used to it there's only like subtle bouts of ignorance that really still upset me i'll give you guys an example the other day this white girl came up to me and I'm gonna call her Becky because she had a very Becky energy to her, you know what I mean? You guys know Becky, okay. So Becky comes up to me and she's like, oh my God, I love your eyebrows, which is actually very nice, but she didn't just like stop at the compliment, she had to keep talking. She was like, you're so lucky that your eyebrows are thick. I have to fill mine in, it's so unfair. And I just lost it on her, you guys. I was like, I'm sorry, Becky, you wanna talk about fair? At least when you came into this world, you had two eyebrows, okay? I was born with one, so. <laughs> you know what, I'm sorry, that's not true. I did have a second eyebrow. It's right here above my lip, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Applause break for a mustache, thank you. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, Becky, anyway. <laughs> So even just recognition on a local scale of just like someone saying in some way or another, like the pat on the back, like, hey, I like what you're doing. You should keep doing it. And I feel like that's all I'm really looking for. It, it sounds weird to just say like validation, but like just kind of um, concrete signs that I'm on the right path is kind of what I'm looking for. When, uh, when my parents found out that I was uh, dating a white guy, they were like surprised which I thought was weird because like listening to the way I talk, I'm basically Becky in brown face, right? You know? <laughs> I always got called a coconut growing up. You guys have heard the term coconut before, right? It means I'm brown on the outside with a white guy inside me. Um, uh, my boyfriend heard me tell that joke and you guys, this is how I knew he was the one, okay? The first time I let him come in me, he called me his coconut cream pie. <laughs> I know, right? It's so cute. Uh, I'm just kidding, you guys. He didn't call me that, okay? I asked him to, but he wouldn't. So. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have to get serious for one second, you guys. You know, as a comedian, I don't get offended a lot, but people keep referring to me with this slur that I, every time I hear it, it makes me sick to my stomach. Can't even believe I'm gonna say it up here. Okay, people keep calling me a woman of color, Am I crazy or is that both racist and sexist? Think about that for a second. I don't meet a white woman and refer to her as a woman of no pigment, you know? <laughs> Do you hear that? A lady of nothing? Like, what? it's insane. Woman of color, three words. That's not even an efficient way to describe someone, okay? I can describe myself less offensively in one word, okay? I'm a cunt. <laughs> I, another cunt out there, all right. <laughs> I, uh, I did this interview for someone's blog the other day and the interviewer was a lady of nothing and she asked me. <laughs> she asked me, she was like, Alicia, as a woman of color, do you feel underrepresented in comedy? So I had to be like, let me stop you there, okay? I don't identify as a woman of color, okay? But as a cunt, <laughs> I feel very well represented in comedy. <laughs> We're definitely the majority, you guys, and it's gonna stay that way for a long, long time, God willing. <laughs> Thank you, you guys are lovely, man. I've been preparing myself to introduce my boyfriend to my very Indian dad for the first time. I've never done that before. And to sort of prepare, I've been immersing my boyfriend into our culture slowly, right? So we've been going out for Indian food twice a week, listening to lots of Indian music. He's really getting the hang of it, you guys. Yesterday, he beat the shit out of me. And <laughs> you guys, I just know my dad's gonna love him. Those of you woeing, you're disrespecting my culture, all right? So take a look in the mirror. You know, you know it really can't be worse than when I met my boyfriend's parents. That went. It was a little weird. He, they're very nice people, his parents, but very religious. So like immediately when I met his mom, first thing she said to me was, I hope you guys are saving yourselves for Jesus. So I was like, I'm sorry, what? Saving myself for Jesus? Of all the religious figures, you guys? 
I'll tell you guys what I told her, and that's this. If I was going to save myself for any god, it wouldn't be Jesus, okay? It would be Ganesh. Does anybody here know Ganesh? Okay, all right. Woke white people. Oh, no, it's, it's the Asian. Okay, all right, fair enough. For, the, for those of you who don't know who Ganesh is, he's the Hindu god with the elephant tusk and four arms. Four arms, ladies. Think about that for a second, okay? That's twice the pleasure that Jesus could provide, you guys. Jesus only had two arms, and um, from what I recall, they were occupied. <laughs> Once again, those of you who laughed are awesome. Those of you who didn't, you're disrespecting my religion. And you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> My best friend is man's best friend, uh, which is dogs. Big dog lover. Any dog people in the audience? Yeah. yeah. I know, but I got a very Vancouver problem, right? I, I can't own a dog because I don't live in a pet-friendly building. Yeah, but uh, fortunately, uh, many people in my neighborhood, uh, they do own dogs, and when they tie them up outside the shopper's drug mart, that is my time. Yeah, that's Ed's time with their dog. <laughs> While they're uh, inside ignoring him, I am outside adoring him. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, just check my Instagram. <laughs> Hashtag cute little guys patiently waiting. <laughs> the owners get weird, though. Ugh. You know, they come out of the store. Now it's all about them. You know, this lady starts chatting me up. I'm like, look, lady, uh, no offense, but I'm trying to spend some quality time with your dog here, and <laughs> quite frankly, you're ruining it. And she's like, well, his name is Baxter, and he's a two-and-a-half-year-old beagle schnauzer cross. I'm like, look, lady, I just spent the last ten minutes with your dog. I think I know what his name is by now. <laughs> what a weirdo. I mean, I, I tend to like things that are about people and human interaction, uh, I like jokes that are uh, about awkward things. Awkward things are like a really good uh, source of comedy for me these days. Um, like for me, the just the tension and the awkwardness of aging, for example. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, but I would say the, the things that make me laugh more often than not are just uh, um, silly, stupid things that people do, you know? Um, things, you know, things that make you think about the stupid things that you've done so that, you know, we all feel, you know, that we're kind of, uh, flawed. I passed this guy the other day, super old guy, like super old guy, you know, he's like riding on a skateboard and I'm looking at this dude going, look how old he is, he's still riding a skateboard, what a fucking loser. And then I jumped on my BMX and I rode away, so... But, uh, but, yeah, no, it's good to be out. Wouldn't you guys agree? Finally. Oh, oh. Woo, good to be out. I was out and about the other day. I bumped into a guy I hadn't seen for years. Uh, so we decided to go into a bar and had a drink. And then, uh, and then you know, partway through the evening, he asked me this question. He said, Ed, uh, what do you think is, is the difference between, like, a buddy and, and a friend? Very interesting question, you know, I had to think about it. I didn't want to give him like a bullshit answer. So um, so what I came up with was a friend, like a real friend, you know, a real friend is somebody who will help you move, right? Yeah, yeah. And then he told me he was moving in two weeks. So I was like, uh, yeah, good luck with that, buddy. <laughs> buddy boy, <laughs> Budinsky. Just make people laugh, you know, honestly. Uh, I'm taking things that are in my head and translating it so that a general audience will find it funny. Um, you know, that's, to me, that's the art of stand-up, you know, taking your individual point of view uh, and, and, and basically making it their point of view as well, at least for the time that you're on stage. It's, it's about, honestly, just extracting laughs from the audience and how you do it is is so varied you know and they're all valid and now i actually I, I lost i lost a bunch of weight you know uh, about 20 pounds yeah thank you yeah for sure 
But it's different. It's different when you lose a bunch of weight in your middle age. You know, when you're a young guy, you know, you're walking around, you lose some weight, and they're like, "Hey, Ed, looking good, buddy. Keep it up. Keep that. Keep keep doing what you're doing. Keep it up, man. Looking great." You know, at my age, they're like, "Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure Ed's dying." <laughs> <laughs> It's a different vibe, man. It's not the same at all, you know. But but you know who you know who likes the weight loss, you know, because I grew the beard and I lost the weight at the same time, you know. So basically, I look a lot different than I did six months ago, you know. And I could tell my wife was like, uh, she was pretty excited, you know. You know, and I'm like, oh, okay. So let me get this straight, you know. So I uh, I look like a, a different guy, and now you're attracted to me. Is that it? You know, I. Yeah, I look like a, I look like a, like some strange dude. Now, now you're all a hot to trot. Is that it? You know, I look like a completely different person, right? And now, and now you're all sexually stimulated. Do I have this correct? And she's like, Yeah, but it's okay, you know, because I know it's still Ed. I said, Who the fuck is Ed? My name is Frank, and I'm here to fix your faucet. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah. So, uh, but it, it's funny. It's weird though because uh, I don't know. Getting it, uh, when you get older, uh, things change. Your perspective changes, you know, when you get older. Because uh, I'll give an example. Like I'm a big hockey fan. And I don't know if there's any hockey fans in this room or not, but yeah. But like when when I was a little guy, you know, like I was, I used to look up to these hockey players, you know, like they're superheroes, right? And like, at my age now, now I'm sitting there watching Hockey Night in Canada, and I can't help but notice that the commentators, you know, they're my age, right? So it's basically the whole show is a bunch of middle-aged dudes commenting on the physical attributes of, like, much younger dudes. <laughs> you know, for two hours, it's like, hey, Bob, you know, I really like this Canucks new rookie. You know, he's a, well, he's a good-looking Swedish kid. <laughs> he's a big boy. A mature frame. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Might be a teenager, but... <laughs> ah, he's got the body of a full-grown man. <laughs> yeah, this kid's really physical, too. You know, really likes to get into those corners and grind it out. <laughs> ah, he's got those big, soft hands. <laughs> Definitely going to make my fantasy team. Our kid's got a great ass. <laughs> yeah, man, things change. I'll tell you something. This is something that young people, like, it'll be hard for you to wrap your brain around, you know? When you get to a certain age, there are certain things you can't even say anymore. <laughs> and you guys are going, uh, yeah, Ed, <laughs> you definitely can't say some things now. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I don't mean those words. I mean just basic words, you know? Like, one of my favorite phrases... One of my favorite things to say when I was a young man in my 20s and maybe my early 30s, whenever some middle-aged dude would piss me off, I love to say, fuck you, old man. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Felt good. I really lean into it, too. Fuck you, old man. Oh. I mean, I can still do it, but, you know, at my age, I'm just screaming at a senior citizen, you know? <laughs> really loses something. Um... But, uh, but no, I, and the, I remember the day I stopped saying it too. <laughs> like I was, uh, I was about to cross the street. I had the green and, uh, some guy ran a red light. Some, some middle-aged dude in a sports car ran a red light, almost killed me. So right on cue, I shouted, fuck you, old man. And the thing is he's, yeah, yeah. And, and he's, he screeched his tires, right? Came to a stop and he rolls down his window. He's like. Old man. It's like, dude, how fucking old are you? <laughs> I was like 46 at the time. <laughs> He's like, you're like two years older than I am. <laughs> oh man, he had me. Man. I didn't know what to say. Yeah, I was, I was, I was struggling for words. He had me backed into a corner. The only thing I could think of at the time was, yeah, well. Why don't you take better care of yourself? <laughs> yeah, and then I jumped on my, my BMX and I rode away. I said cunt before I was an inspirational speaker. I still say it. 
go fuck yourself. So uh, what I do, my day job is I speak in schools. I'm an inspirational speaker for youth. Thank you. Some of you are like, holy fuck, that guy talked in my school. A lot more F-bombs in this set. Um, but yeah, I talk about, I, I, I guess if you could like sum it up, about making good choices. Making wise choices, which is important. But I always make wise choices. Like, I started getting tattooed in my 30s. First tattoo I got, GFYS across my knuckles. <laughs> some of you are getting it. Um, so, some of you can spell. Um, go fuck yourself across my knuckles. Yourself is uh, one word, so. <laughs> came home from. <laughs> I came from Vegas regretting that. Like, I've got the acronym for Go Fuck Yourself with a typo permanently tattooed across my knuckles on my microphone hand <laughs> that I use to inspire children. Like, fuck! to make good choices, of all things. <laughs> Fuck me. So yeah, I'm like, oh, I kind of regret it. Like, what do you do with that? What do you do with that tattoo? And you know what I did? I went and fucked myself. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know what, Tasha? <laughs> that worked out pretty good, go fuck yourself. As a reminder to masturbate if you ever need one, all right? <laughs> Uh, the kids will ask me sometimes at the end of the presentation in their school, like, they'll, they'll be like, what's that tattoo stand for? I can't tell them, go fuck yourself, right? So I'm like, good for your school. <laughs> God forgive your sins. <laughs> and obviously, just like you, they know that's bullshit. But, uh... I mean, speaking, I have a purpose that I'm... You know, I got paralyzed in a car crash, which put me in the wheelchair, which is where the speaking journey started doing traffic safety stuff, trying to help youth make wise choices and ultimately not die or kill somebody in a car crash. Then the sort of messaging of that expanded, suicide prevention, mental health, all kinds of, there's just all like a really uplifting, powerful message, hopefully inspiring people to make good choices, look after each other, you know, tough through hard times, never give up. A lot of stuff like that, which is super meaningful in the course for youth to know you've had that impact on them, maybe change their life, maybe save their life feels amazing. Yeah, they're pretty quick. They ask me all kinds of questions. They, they like to come up afterwards and sometimes ask a question. Sometimes they'll tell a story, just want to chat, maybe a hug. Uh, I was in Oregon speaking, like just outside of Portland, and this girl came up and she was like pretty like timid little thing, came up and was like, yo, like, so you said in your presentation that you do comedy too. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, that's cool. Can I tell you a joke? And I was like, fuck yeah. Yeah, I didn't say fuck yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Please tell me a joke. Do you want to hear the joke? Yeah. Yes. So the joke was, what is the hardest thing about eating a vegetable? <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, uh, but for those you don't, the punchline, the wheelchair. <laughs> yes. yeah. I didn't write that joke. That's an old school joke. Like that kid was a hack. Like you didn't even make that up. Uh, principal was mortified. Like, oh, how did Gary get out of the special room? I could tell I was a big fan of Gary. I was like, yeah. Gary's awesome. Made me laugh. I like that kid. I was down in Florida, um, and afterwards, like pretty much half the school came on stage, just just hanging out, wanted to, all that, wanted to meet me and all that stuff. And uh, one, he was kind of the cool kid, like he, he, you know, he had like that confidence too. He's nicely dressed, athletic looking guy, and he had a question, but he was like, he was nervous to ask it. I'm like, dude, honestly, you can just ask. Trust me, but ask pretty much everything at this point. Just go ahead. And he was like, all right. He's like, does your dick work? <laughs> Which I think is a fair question. You know, maybe people in here might be wondering, my dick works? 
Potent if you are, talk to me after the show. We'll, um, <laughs> we'll find out, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so the kid, he asked me where dick worked, and I was like, yes, it does. And his response was, sweet, fuck bitches. <laughs> High five. I'm like, I can't fucking high five a teenager. Like, fuck it. So I was just like, go fuck yourself. Going into comedy, I just wanted to pretty much be an asshole and tell fucking jokes that make me laugh and fuck with people on stage because I already have a career where I inspire people. So I wasn't, I really just wanted to go and have fun doing comedy. And now, like five years in, I'm like wondering, should I have some kind of message? I think you start to try to kind of find your voice or look for a voice. That was a joke, right? That was a joke, obviously. I, I don't feel that way. It's hard to tell jokes these days, you know? Sometimes people think you're being serious, you're being real. Tough times, right? A lot of division. People don't want to listen to each other, but we need to listen to each other. We need to show more love. We need to have fun. We're all here tonight, telling jokes, hearing jokes, having a good time, sharing love, bonding, right? I don't agree with everyone's opinion on things. They don't agree with mine, that's fine. But I think we should hear each other out. Right? Yeah. Thank you. That's my time. No, um, I'll finish the joke. I chat with my neighbors the other day and uh, they were telling me some sort of ideas they had about the whole COVID thing. And I, I was conspiracy stuff, I guess, if you will, if you're gonna call anything, but you know, I. I heard them out. You gotta hear people out. I, I've, I've talked to flat earthers. I can empathize with a flat earther. Because I am not a fan of hills. Thank you. Oh, thank you, yes. Oh, you guys don't like hills either. <laughs> We have so much in common. Um, I'm pretty loose with my comedy. I'm not going to be racist or be overly or like misogynist or homophobic or anything like that. Like I would never, those are just boundaries I wouldn't cross just because I don't, I'm not that person. I don't want to be that person. But most of my stuff sort of like self-deprecating. Definitely there's a lot of wheelchair jokes. Um, I, I don't really confine myself to like, don't say this, don't joke about that, don't whatever. Um, yeah, and I think mostly because it's mostly self-deprecating. Like, if you're going to get offended on my behalf, like, you're a fucking idiot, so go fuck yourself anyway. Like Comedy is my hobby, but stand-up is my dream. So thanks for coming out tonight. <laughs> Have a good night. It's kind of a weird thing to try to capture a moment because that moment's already gone. But I think there's something very human about that. What do you think the loneliest thing you've ever done is? <laughs> don't, don't yell it out because I know some of you and you have some shit. But it, is, but it is an interesting to think about because loneliness is not just like a, like a temporary state of being or if you're me, part of who you are. It's an action. It's a thing you do, like eating KD out of the pot you cooked it in is lonely. <laughs> like, you, you could keep, like, oh, I'm going to share this with my wife. That's never happened. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> It's, it's, it's actually interesting, like craft dinner from creation to consumption is a masterclass in solitude. <laughs> like it, like every time, every time somebody looks, thinks like, oh, that looks good. Like the Voyager satellite drifts another 10,000 miles from Earth. <laughs> For every cheese powder packet torn asunder, Another YouTuber re-records Hallelujah. <laughs> I heard there was a secret. Call. 
that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you die anyway. I'll uh, fuck it. I'll open up. Um, the loneliest thing that I've ever done, like besides this, the loneliest thing that I've ever done is microwave hand lotion. You know what I like about that joke? Is one, you can't unknow it. And two, there's at least a couple of you gonna be leaving here tonight like that guy's a fucking genius. What stand up provides for me is a lot of heartbreak. <laughs> and. But also when it goes well and you feel the way that you're supposed to feel from it, there's nothing better. And it's trying to... Normally I, I don't like attention, but it's very much parsing out and creating the level and the intensity of, inten of attention that I want and trying to be understood and liked and acknowledged in increments that I can that I can control and that hopefully I can repeat over and over and over again. I spend a lot of time uh, online. That's probably surprising to some of you. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, like here's, here's something you have to understand. Like, like one time I got a sunburn while I was inside <laughs> reading about the sun. You understand? I'm not built for the elements. <laughs> Like, this is my environment right now, is like, except that's beginning to be a bit too much. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time uh, online, and normally I'm not for the death penalty. <laughs> Where did you think this was going? <laughs> you people are crazy. I, normally I'm not for it, but there is one exception and you can carve this into my gravestone. Anyone who puts a recipe online with a 20 paragraph preamble should be guillotined in front of City Hall. You are people of culture, thank you. If you don't understand that, God damn the thought of you. 20 paragraphs. It's, it's always just this slog of just shit you have to go through. Like, I've, I've never seen something like, oh, that eggplant parm looks good, but I wish it was harder to get to. You know, I wish somebody would put a Dostoevsky novel in front of it for a second. Russian lit jokes. Um, but it's always a drag, it's always this slog to get through it's it, you know my, my great grandfather brought this recipe for diarrhea salads <laughs> when he escaped the austro-prussian war of 1866 and now i feed it to my impotent half-wit husband and our <laughs> boring white fucking children vajonica ensley and caitlin with an f <laughs> Nothing happened. You have to make, you have to make it a story. You have to make something happen. Like I, I want what I want is like some, like Henry Rollinsy, 
like stream of conscious perverted Americana kind of like it was 1979 I had just seen the Bad Brains close out the night at a place called the Bayou they had finished their, with their track Pay to Come and I was nursing a six inch gash in my forehead from when the lead singer for Human Rights threw a box of bladed dildos into the audience and I tried to catch one with my teeth and a drop a drop of blood fell out onto my copy of Further Soliloquies by Dion McGregor and formed the exact same shape of the northern border of Rwanda when I hear a at my door. It is my neighbor, Crazy John. He had been up 72 hours wearing only an oven mitt, not on his hands, holding the most delicious quiche I have ever had. I would read that. <laughs> because this is ending and because this doesn't matter, that I don't want to be remembered. I don't want to be famous. I just want to feel okay. I will. I, I want to do one more th uh, thing for you, and then I will... Um you know, shuffle off this mortal coil. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about impressions? Do you like impressions? Are we for them? I, mean, I don't know if he's, I don't know what I would have done if he said no, I'd be fucked. It's, it's gonna happen anyway. <laughs> uh, it's a very quick one, a couple very quick impressions for you. Uh, this is my impression of Bill Burr uh, as Julius Caesar, Bill Burr as Julius Caesar. Oh, it's Brutus! Thank you, that was... <laughs> for the English majors. <laughs> um, this next one is... Uh, <laughs> my impression of a guy flirting with a woman in her DMs. There's a guy flirting with a woman online. Hey! Hey. 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 Whore. Guys, thank you so much. I wanted to find my voice and figure out, um, you know, what kind of comedy I, well, like, I didn't really know what I wanted from comedy for a really long time. I knew I wanted to keep doing it, and I never wanted to stop doing it, but um, then in 2020, I got paralyzed and ended up in a wheelchair, and um, then I kind of found my voice. Like I spent 10 years being all over the map with my comedy and then I got hurt and everything just aligned in my head where I was like, I don't want to keep wasting time with comedy anymore. I just want to do it. So um, now that I have that fire under my belly to just do it and not suck and not um, try to be different or like, place myself differently than other people. I mean, I'm different enough already in a wheelchair that I can just make people laugh. And if I get an opportunity from that, then, you know, that's great. But for me, I, I do it for me because there's nothing better than the high of watching somebody laugh. I got paralyzed during the pandemic. Um, I couldn't get my sourdough starter to work, so I jumped out of a window. Um, that's actually not true. I got paralyzed during the pandemic. I um, gave my grandmother COVID, so she kicked me out of the window. That's also not true. I got paralyzed during the pandemic. 
I watched Tiger King. <laughs> and I decided to try meth so I could get two husbands. <laughs> um, none of that is true, but I did get paralyzed during the pandemic. Um, like, right on March 11th, 2020, 2020, no, not 2021, that's too early. Um, I got paralyzed on March 11th, 2020, which was the day that the WHO declared COVID like a global pandemic. Um, so I got paralyzed, my life was changed forever. And um, then the entire world stopped because I wasn't already a middle-class white girl who thought the world revolved around me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just gonna stay hunched over like this for a while. Um, yeah, like I thought the world revolved around me, but Facebook couldn't get their algorithms to work. Like, they still advertise my dance classes. <laughs> All the time. And then when they're not doing that, they're um, advertising, like, lesbian dating sites because they know I can't feel my vagina. And I just, like, that's my only option, I guess, at this point. <laughs> um, someone who just wants love, you know? I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> For me, I mean, when I got into performing, I I basically, the idea was that the only way that I got over a bad day was by laughing at something. So for me, I just want to make people get over their bad days. I got paralyzed at work and um, I have a lot of members of my WorkSafe team now, like more members than I have of my family. I talked about a blister on my foot and I had to talk to nine people about it. <laughs> um, I haven't had that many people interested in my feet since I was on MySpace. <laughs> and I'm serious, like I had a really cool like contrast photo of like my foot, you know, it was high contrast, it was like, the saturation was good. It was like, I was 15 and there was my foot like with black nail polish. It was great, but um, that's, you know, that's where I'm at. Um, <laughs> Walter, don't bring the camera here. <laughs> You're making me too nervous. I was like, that's not good for me. Um, don't do that right in my face. Um, <laughs> um, now I paint when I'm really drunk. And that's about it. Only when you're drunk? Sometimes, yeah, most of the time. Do you have canvases or like any paints? Or um, yeah, I do. I have actually the cameras on one of my canvas thingies. And then I've got a bunch of paintings over here. Um, <laughs> that the, you can't see this, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I paint. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Jersey Shore. I know the first person that yayed at that. Um, so I, I've been listening to a lot of Jersey Shore, listening, watching, I mean, <laughs> and... Um, it's because I can't watch anything else right now. Like, I can't watch regular TV where people are doing shit while walking. Like, if I see one more asshole frolic in a field, <laughs> I'm gonna lose my goddamn shit. Like, if... So, I watch Jersey Shore because all they do is get drunk and fight with their friends. And I can do that. <laughs> I, I can absolutely do that. I can also, um, you know, like, it is hard for me to watch them go and have sex with people because I can't do that. And, um, you know, dance on tables and do the whole thing. But 
when it boils down to it, I can still go to jail for tax evasion. <laughs> I've just been on a, a mental health medication for a really long time that um, I get a medical, I get a reaction to it, um, like an allergic reaction from the medication sometimes. It's usually triggered by anxiety and it affects my vision and makes me really anxious and um, I almost feel like I can do like nothing at all, like even move. Um, and so I got that right before the show and you know there was the huge crowd and you know I cared about the show and I was really happy for the opportunity so I just pushed through and did it and so that meant that meant a lot to me that I um that I actually did a successful set that night for me that was a moment that because I felt so much like I couldn't do the show and I still pushed through and I actually did a good job and that was one of the first times I actually felt like a professional comic. A lot of people that are in wheelchairs um, end up emotional, motivational speakers, um, not Kevin. Um, but I've heard this. I've heard that this is a thing. Um, but everybody tells me, like, I should be a motivational speaker, and I, I should be a motivational speaker, but I'm not because... <laughs> Um, I got paralyzed at work and I have no like meaning or like new thing I can tell people like no lesson I've learned about it so basically like what would I do just go from school to school telling kids not to get a job <laughs> I think I think is uh, is uh, I, this is an outlet for my rage, right? It's not it's not a creative outlet per se. It's an outlet to a rage, or else I will be like, you know, going on the street and yelling at people, or having road rage and everything, right? Oh my God! Look at all the couples in the audience. Smart, okay? Listen, smart. If you're a dude out there, then you wanna fuck your girl. Bring her to a comedy show. Because if you bring her to watch a band, your girl wanna fuck the guy in the band. <laughs> right? Like a coke addict who does music? Are you serious? That guy is ripped for her pleasure. Right? <laughs> but if you bring her to a comedy show, your girl wanna fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> because we're all garbage human beings out here. Like we are just terrible, terrible people. Like I'm not that angry off stage. Like honestly, I'm not that angry off stage. But like I feel like that's just that's me that I grew up as. The like the on stage is actually the real me, but off stage is the social me where like society has put pressure on people who are angry, or people who are annoying, and people who are angry. So you so you start slowly hide that part of you yourself so that you 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 can adjust to normal society, right? Because you can't just yell at people in normal society. That's that's not polite. Like that's not, that not, none of this is polite, so. Oh, I fucked up my life. <laughs> I know exactly when I fucked up. College, anyone been to college here? <laughs> Your college kids these days are such piece of shit, right? <laughs> like I know this one guy from college who can build any kind of bridge in the world, any kind of bridge. But you know what kind of bridge you couldn't build? The bridge of human connection. <laughs> That guy is never getting laid, right? <laughs> but the dumbest guy I know, the dumbest guy I know, spent 80K to go to engineering school, graduated, can't find a job, and now doing stand-up comedy at the fucking Billboard. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? I'm doing a mixtape, are you fucking serious? Get the fuck out of here! The, this whole thing about like stand up comedy like po politics I think is because of John Stewart fucking John like honestly that guy like he opened the floodgate he did not know what he was doing he ha he he was cashing in on the whole political joke thing and then he got out of hand the floodgate is open you can't put it back in the box and now we are we're responsible for commentating on society but like we're the we're the last bastion of commentating on society because we don't trust preachers anymore right we don't trust 
religion anymore with this shit. So you know, who who else could do good public speaking, right? Obviously, politicians can't. Hey, oh, that's a that's a Biden joke for you to date this entire video, right? It's just like yeah, f- five years from now when they when they see the president of the rock, they're like ah. Oh, he he knows how to talk. What are you talking about? But right now we have Biden and he cannot do public speaking that well. So, boom, boom, politically involved now. Ah, this is now a political thing. By the way, uh, as a representation representation of the Chinese race, uh, sorry about COVID. That was <laughs> that was our bad. <laughs> we should have seen it coming, right? Like it was a year of the rats. And we decided to celebrate the year by eating a flying rat. Like, what the fuck was wrong with us? Right? Like, this is why Asians should not be the first one going to space. Because we will eat all the aliens. Right? Like, face hugger comes to China, ah, and he just wackles a walk and compel that shit. Right? Put a little teriyaki sauce on it. It really makes the acid blood go well. Like, it's great. Predator goes to China, all he's like, <laughs> but it's not the predators. Chinese people's chopsticks and <laughs> I do video game, which is a creative outlet because uh, the the strategies are are very unique. I play I play video games and not not really that much creative outlet. I wouldn't even call my comedy that creative. I'm just yelling at people. Hey, lady, is your name Onyxia? Because I'm gonna raise your lair tonight. There is silence in the room. Let me <laughs> let me explain. Onyxia is a dragon from World of Warcraft, which you kill in a 40-man raid. Now, what is a 40-man raid? A 40-man raid is when you get 40 versions together to kill a dragon, right? Now, the trick to this raid is that there's baby eggs in the corner. So you can't, you can't touch the baby eggs because when a guy touch a baby egg, baby dragons come out and ruin your dreams, right? So all I'm saying is, lady, I can raw dog you all day long without getting you pregnant because my sperm is a well-trained raid machine, right? Yeah, that's right. Also, I'm in Fur House, that's why. <laughs> no, I think this is this could go viral, you know? It's just like, you never know what goes viral in this town, right? So, you know, you never know. It's like one of these things goes viral, and then we all die in a horrible car crash. I don't know. Anything could happen. There's Anything a lot to be happen. concerned about right now, right? There's a lot to be scared of, right? COVID, racism. You know what I'm scared of? Diabetes. <laughs> That is a fucked up shit. <laughs> diabetes. Right? There's like two types of diabetes. One is you eat too much sugar and then you die. And then another time is that like you don't eat enough sugar and then you die. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is that? Right? Like, would you rather eat too much sugar and die or not enough sugar and die? I don't know. Fucking. Would you rather eat too much sugar and die or not enough sugar and die? <laughs> too much? No! No, it's way more fucked up if you don't eat enough sugar then you die, okay? Imagine the scenario, right? Imagine the scenario. I have the type of diabetes where if I don't eat enough sugar, I die, right? So I stare in the mirror one day, I'm like, oh my god, I'm a fat fuck. I gotta, I gotta lose weight, right? I gotta lose weight, right? I become a vegan, so I give up meat, I give up sugar, I give up happiness, right? I give up all that, I give up all that shit. I feel weaker and weaker, but I assume that's just being a vegan, that's just a thing. <laughs> and then I feel weaker and then I just die. I just die because my cell ran out of energy. That's fucked up. I died trying to improve my life. I don't want to die ironically, I want to die due to my own comeuppance, right? <laughs> like, I want to die getting murdered by a hooker. Like, honestly. <laughs> You know, just like, ah, I'm so lonely. Ah, let's get a hooker. Ah, normal hooker's too expensive. Let's just get one in Mexico because it's way cheaper, huh? And then the hooker just steals both my kidneys. Like, what the fuck? 
usually they just steal one, but this little girl had his kid going to uh, Harvard, so like she had to steal both of them. And I was like, I died for a good cause. At least the kid is going to Harvard, right? <laughs> or, or I tell some really fucked up joke, and they get gunned down by Kyle Rittenhouse. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, he's coming after me. He has COVID. This is self-defense. Ah. Yeah, it's, I can get away with it. Yeah, it's because I, Asians, Asians came up with COVID. Yeah, that's why. That's why that joke works. I can get away with it. The impetus to be like, I am tired of this material, but I know it's good. So I'm not gonna like just stop doing the material and let it die. I'm gonna like capture the material at this point and then I'm going to, you know, have a new secular like creative process and hopefully um, freshen up my app with like ideas like I'm having now and make it more like relevant to like where I'm at in my life right now. So it's really, and I have really experienced like sort of a weight lifted like after recording because we're almost through the edit <laughs> and uh, I'm just ideas are coming and they're they're newer and you know I'm a better writer now and it's just exciting like it's it's like why you do comedy and because I have all this space for it um, there's like a lot of possibilities and it's sort of like when an artist looks at the blank canvas you know it's exciting hey! Hey! I just quit smoking. I like to show it off off the top. <laughs> I've got a lot of breath. The worst thing about quitting smoking is living. <laughs> you have to do a lot more living once you quit. <laughs> I'm just joking. I can't lie to your faces, guys. I just started smoking again. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to do life right, right? I, I relate to that a lot about having like, you know, my good back pocket jokes and like sort of having to like get myself out of my comfort zone sometimes when I feel like I'm relying too heavily on them. And so it is good to like look to younger comics and see that, you know, they're very versatile and adapting and that's a good like inspiration and reminder to like stay, keep your stuff fresh and but at the same time, it was a good reminder to me that I had like a lot of good jokes that I should have put on an album probably like five years ago. And it gave me a kick in the ass to do it. Yeah, I'm 40, I'm 41. Is anyone 41 here? Okay, yeah, a couple of people, nice. <laughs> I think I'm pretty secure with my age. I think I'm pretty good, but I will get in some circumstances, right? Where I'm like hanging out with a lot of younger people because I'm a comedian, right? And I'll forget. And I'll, I'll try to be cool and like down with whatever, right? And uh, <laughs> like once I was hanging out with some uh, comics at a picnic and they were talking about this new app. It's called WhatsApp. <laughs> I was like, yeah, cool, what's up? What's up? <laughs> then they knew I was born in 1980, guys. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm gonna get one of these uh, fans only accounts. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. And because of my age, I think I have to start thinking about whether I want kids or not because I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> I'm just joking, that's just a prank. I pulled it on my boyfriend, he hated it. <laughs> he didn't talk to me for a week. Uh, yeah, like I've never given birth, but I have sneezed out my tampon, so. <laughs> it's basically the same thing. <laughs> 
It's a super. Go, 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 go. Any other rocket launchers in the house? Yeah, yeah, we're Keeglin, my people. <laughs> no, I, I do, uh, I make jokes about like, um, you know, having a kid, but I do want to think about it like seriously, like I don't want any regrets, right? And I, I don't know, but I think this is a, a clue whether to whether I should have kids or not. Also, it's very difficult. Like my brain doesn't really want to have children, but my body's trying to make them with whoever. Like it's super hormonal. <laughs> yeah, I wake up every, every morning. I, it's like baby, baby. <laughs> I'm checking out every guy, even the old ones. Like nice walker, what's up? <laughs> Got any swimmers left or what? <laughs> You guys don't like old people, or? <laughs> no, I do have to think about it. Yeah, like I, I was uh, hanging out on uh, West Broadway. I was walking down the street, and I noticed there were some mothers. They were parked outside of Boston Pizza. They had their kids in strollers and on leashes. <laughs> Except there was this one free-range motherfucker, like, ah! you know, like running around. You know, like, he was trying to run like straight into the street, like he was trying to get dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I was the only one like closest to him, so I did whatever any of you guys would do. I encouraged him. I was like, keep your eye on the ball, <laughs> <laughs> live your dreams, you know. No, I didn't do that, guys. I stretched my friggin' bird arm out there and I gripped him as hard as my talons could hold. <laughs> yeah, so he wouldn't die. Well, hold your applause, Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too late. It's too late. You guys just want nature to take its course. <laughs> you see what's going on here. Well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not telling you this to brag about saving a life, even though I did. I'm, I'm telling you this because a strange scenario that occurred afterwards, what happened was I was holding on to him. As I was holding on to him, his mom flew up behind me. She grabbed onto him. As, she, as soon as she grabbed onto him, I let go and I said, sorry, I apologize for saving a life. Yeah, you know you're Canadian when. <laughs> But then I started obsessing over it. Like, why would I actually apologize? What was the reason, right? I figured it out. It's because you're not supposed to touch children. <laughs> Especially other people's. <laughs> or the parents won't take them back. <laughs> so I have a toddler now. His name's Skyler. I don't like that name, but <laughs> it's what he responds to, so. You know, I'm not, like, going to stand here and pretend that, like, my life has always been easy, and I, I feel like if I took, you know, a few different turns in my life, I could be very well one of the people that I support at my work. I think comedy really helped me in those points of my life to, like, at least have, like, um, something occupying me, some place I could go to like share my thoughts and see if other people were connecting with me. I have a great job now. I, uh, I'm really happy with my life. I work in the downtown east side. I'm a peer support worker. I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I had to uh, today actually, just in, during the day, I had to respond to an OD and I had to do a naloxone and some CPR on somebody. It can get a bit scary, you know, but I really love the work. Um, so like what happens, like, I just want to like teach you guys a little thing before I leave. Um, maybe you guys can uh, make some good use of it. And before I tell you this, I'll just let you know, like probably the other most stressful time I had at my job uh, was when I got prick with a needle. Yeah, it was really worst case scenario because there wasn't even any heroin left in it. <laughs> Are you guys on the H? Stay off the H, yeah. <laughs> so there's this one circumstance I got in where I had to respond uh, to somebody. He was lying in the middle of the street, and so we had to go out with the Narcan kit or these Norloxone kits. You've probably seen them if you don't already have them. And the, the thing you want to do are these three steps before you check their breath or their pulse. So you want to make sure that they're awake. So the first thing you do is make noise. You go, hey, 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 <laughs> right in their face, OK? Just do that. <laughs> Okay, and then if they don't respond, which this guy didn't in the middle of the street, 
Then you take your knuckles and you drag them on the sternum like this, okay? So I was like, Ugh! as hard as you can, because they'll have a response, a survival response, and they'll get up. And this guy didn't respond. And then the next thing that is almost exactly like that maneuver is you can take your thumb and your pointer finger and you can pinch near their, their collarbone and their clavicle, right? You can pinch as hard as you can and they should respond to that. I did that to this guy and he was like, <laughs> which is literally the best thing that can happen when you think someone's about to die. <laughs> consideration try to realize like we're all the same <laughs> 